11 years ago last month, the militarized wall that divides the northern part of Cyprus from the southern part of Cyprus, Turkish Cypriot, North Cyprus, from Greek Cypriot, Southern Cyprus, Republic of Cyprus, fractured. Five armies moved aside for the opening of a single checkpoint and for the first time in 30 years since the war in 1974, Cypriots who had been on one or the other side could cross back to the other community to see houses, villages, coffee shops, churches, mosques that they had left. For people who were less than 30 to live for the first time memories that they had borrowed from their families. Now, that event was akin to the fall of the Berlin Wall in its significance. My cousin's uh, husband, who is Cypriot, had left in his teens the northern part of Cyprus. He's from a village called Zodia. And when the first checkpoint opened, he wanted to cross and see what what his house looked like, what, his, what he had left. So we all went with him, my cousin, him, their six-year-old daughter, me, several sets of grandparents. We pile into two cars and we all go over to the other side of the uh, country, cross the checkpoints, and it takes about three hours because something happens that's very funny when you leave a conflict and when you leave a space that you can't come back to. It remains frozen in your mind as it was, in this case, 30 years ago. Meanwhile, the place that you left continues to live. Communities are built around it, societies are built around it, but it's frozen in your mind, which is why it took 30, uh, four hours, three, four hours for us to find actually his house, a trip that subsequently takes 40 minutes. So we get there, he finds his house, he finds his uncle's house, he finds his old school, he's very excited, and the most remarkable thing happened when this 45-year-old man suddenly regressed to 15 when he found his football pitch, right? And he was very excited and he was running around and he was looking at the pitch and he was saying, and this happened here and this happened there. And it was a beautiful moment. It was a beautiful two hours actually for him. Regardless of the trauma of the years that happened previous to that and how he interpreted the coming back afterwards, those two hours were pure and beautiful for him. But I tell you this story not because of him, but because of the reaction of his daughter, who was six years old at the time and standing by my side when we were walking around. And Maria, as her father was regressing to 15 and running crazily around a football pitch, she looked like this. And she was frozen and she was ashen the entire time. And I said, Maria, what's going on? Are you okay? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not okay. I don't like it here. I don't feel safe here. And I asked her, why don't you feel safe? It was a beautiful day, sunny day, like Cyprus has. There weren't many people around, and the people who were there were very friendly. And she said, I don't trust the Turks. They'll kill us again. I want to leave. We have to leave. I don't like it. And we left. Now, Maria was six years old, and she grew up in a family that didn't really talk about the conflict and that protected her from what had happened. And she had only been to school for one year, and she lived in a conflict that's considered safe. The war ended in 1974, 25 years before she was born, and no one has subsequently officially been killed since that date. But that was enough. The surrounding environment was corrosive enough for that six-year-old child to understand uh, trauma, to understand that there was an enemy, and that she was in an enemy environment. So I've been asked today to talk about conflict through the lens of throwing caution to the wind. And Maria is a very, very small example of transgenerational trauma. 
conflict leaves scars in a society that are much deeper and that last for much longer than we who are outside of that society realise. So I want you to think about a conflict where, usually an ethnic conflict, where uh, the population is interspersed, people live together, and then after the conflict, populations separate into mono-ethnic communities, right? And there could be multiples. But all of a sudden, your enemy lives just there. Just over there, your former neighbours, usually, five kilometres, 15 kilometres, 50 kilometres, just there, those people who caused that loss to you and the people that you love. And after a conflict, two things happen. The first is that societies have need for closure. But what rubs up against that need for closure is a real trauma and an inability usually to deal with the past or to deal with what happened. People are fatigued and they don't, mostly don't want to deal with it or it gets uh, dealt with in very simplistic ways. People have a need for answers and those answers end up, and those answers centre around what happened and why did it happen. And generally, this is a generalisation, but what happens is that a simplistic narrative, a simplistic moral universe gets built and it involves we the innocent, they the perpetrators on all sides, right? So that simplistic moral universe, the need for closure, then harnesses on to the need for permanence. This is the second thing. In, in a life that people know is very, very impermanent, there is a need for unequivocal truths. So once those very simple definitions are given, they become fixed and they become unchangeable. And those fixed, unchangeable, simple narratives get reinforced usually by media and by political elites, and usually for their own gain. So a society will simultaneously get stuck in the past and at the same time not acknowledge the legacy of violence that lives around them in which they live. And the impact of the trauma on that society becomes invisible. When the instinct is to keep apart and to nurture a community's own pain, people who cross boundaries, who reach out to enemy communities, who throw caution to the wind, they become examples of empathy and understanding, but that becomes a threat. At the same time that they are a threat, these are the people who have the most power to bring change. They embody change. So I work with the Institute for Conflict Cooperation and Security here at the University of Birmingham and I specialise in transitional justice. Transitional justice is essentially a field that has grown around a single question. How do we deal with the, institu with the institutionalised of human rights abuses? How do we deal with the legacy of trauma after conflict? And there are many answers to this and it's very holistic. I will take only a sliver, which is civil society responses in post-conflict countries. Now, why is civil society, uh, wh wh where is the risk and what does civil society do? In Guatemala, after the Civil War, uh, a Catholic human rights organization worked on a project called REMI and what they did was amass tens of thousands of testimonies showing the institutionalization of violence, actually the army's targeting of the indigenous population to wipe them out. Now these tens of thousands of testimonies were collected into a report and then disseminated. And they created an important opening for a debate in Guatemala in the society. Two days after the report was published, the leader of that initiative, a Catholic bishop, was bludgeoned to death in his garage with a concrete slab. I've had the privilege of working with really extraordinary people who are very brave who do quiet work all over the world in lots of different countries. And the question that's put to me and that I put to them is, why do you risk your lives over and over again? Why do you risk your energy? Why do you give your time to something, to a change that might not happen, that is unlikely to happen in your lifetime? 
And the answer that is always given to me is, that is a false question. It's not we who risk. The risk isn't in what we do. The risk lies in leaving things the way that they are. Because if you carry a simplistic narrative about what happened and why it happened, the next time that tension spikes, you look to that community over there and what happened. So the history of unaddressed massive abuse causes or perpetuates intercommunal tension. It also puts stress on institutions that are already broken and it slows down development goals and security goals. Now in this context, I wanna share two great acts of taking risks in two different countries now who risk in order to make the future safer. The first is an organization called Together We Can, which is Cypriot and multi-communal. It, it is a representative of families, it's an organization representative of families of people who went missing in the conflict, whose bodies have usually not been found even today, um, and who bear witness to that. It is representative of people across the divide and it is unique for that. The second organization is in Bosnia and it's called the Helsinki um, Committee for Human Rights. And in this project, it works on education for secondary school students. So together we can focus, as its mantra is hatred will no longer be used, to, our name will no longer be used to perpetuate hatred. And Helsinki's focus is we need to interrogate our past. So around 2,000 people went missing in Cyprus between 1963 and 1974. And from 1995, three journalists really pioneered work on the missing. And they kept putting out stories from families of missing people into the public forum. And it was the first time that this was done. And they did it because they said that the families of the missing were being used for, for political games to perpetuate nationalist agendas on both sides. One of these three journalists has been working on this issue, she continues today and it's been 20 years, and she created a public space to allow the families of victims and the survivors of atrocity to tell their own stories. And this had three important effects. The first was that she fractured nationalist narratives. Because until that time, there were only two versions of what happened in Cyprus. She allowed the creation of a space for a third. The second is that flowed on to show how the education system was inadequate and that students were learning really inadequate things and being taught really inadequate things about Cypriot history. And the third is that she built bridges between the two communities um, and between the families of the missing, and out of that work came Together We Can. Now, Together We Can is a radical organization. It is very small, it is very grassroots, and what they do is they go, usually a, a Greek-speaking Cypriot and a Turkish-speaking Cypriot, uh, Turkish Cypriot will go to community groups, to schools, to universities, to public talks, to the press, and they will share the stories of their loss. But they frame those stories within a very specific agenda. And that is that the atrocities of the past need to be talked about. They need to be acknowledged and they need to be addressed so that we can learn from them. So their thing is to create a space for dialogue. And together, if you interrogate the past, then you can understand what were the drivers for conflict and what might they be today. Now, in a great example of how an individual grassroots effort can transfer to institutional change, their work has been incorporated into a, um, a state education pack that should be used on both sides of the divide, actually, that looks at empathy, that builds empathy, because empathy is the first thing that gets uh, squashed in trauma, in conflict. Um, so the education pack uses the, the narrative of the missing and the experiences of these families to, t to talk about empathy and to build empathy between the communities. It's a semester-long pack. To keep 
to the theme of education, but to move to, Mo to Bosnia. This NGO, together with activists, uh, educationalists and practitioners, has been working on a multimedia education tool for secondary school students in Bosnia. Why is that important? Bosnia, Bosnia's war ended 19 years ago and it's been relatively peaceful since then. Bosnia is a sophisticated country, very cosmopolitan. It's pre-EU accession, everything, it's relatively wealthy, everything should be flowing along. At the same time, Bosnia has a 60% youth unemployment rate. And recent surveys have shown that tension between Bosnian Serb, Bosnian Croat, Bosnian Muslim youth under the age of 25 has reached the level that it did during the conflict. So after 19 years, trust between young people of the three communities has declined and tension has spiked. That and other indicators has made the UN in an internal assessment change its uh, categorization of Bosnia to pre-conflict 19 years later. What that means is that students who are tomorrow's leaders don't trust each other today. So this education pack has two parts and the first part is theoretical and, each, and the community, it goes inside the communities and it talks about the history of Bosnia, which in itself is revolutionary because most communities will learn only from their own perspective what happened during the war. And the second part of it is practical, and students go out to sites of atrocities, to concentration camps, um, to memorialised areas, with survivors of those concentration camps or of what happened in that area, and they begin to interrogate their own understanding of history. Now, this is important because what that does is teach the students to think critically about what they know, to unpack that, and to think about the impact of the legacy that they've inherited on the way that they live their lives today. What is the impact of the past on what you're doing now? So it reflects on both the events and the future and how it could work better. Both of these countries, both of these organisations focus on three things. One is empathy, the next is understanding, and finally, they focus on interrogating what you know in order to think about where that, is going to, where that takes you as a society. Now, my cousin Maria is now 17, and she hasn't crossed the checkpoint to the northern part since that time we went together 11 years ago. And she is not unique. As an international community, we hyper-focus on ending a conflict, on making a peace deal. But we globally need to understand and we need to have the attention span to give our focus and our support to long-term grassroots projects that deal with the legacy of conflict after war. Because if we don't, then like Sisyphus, we will continue to push the, the boulder of peace building uphill, only to watch it roll back down again with the ignition of the next conflict. Thank you. <laughs>